Great. So, uh, when I got invited to give this TED talk about two months ago, uh, I think the first thing I thought about is uh, what if I done to go beyond. And uh, at that time, I hadn't really given it much thought, but I'm like, okay, let me watch a few videos, a few TED videos, a few TEDx videos, and maybe I'll go get inspired. Right? Uh, so, I watched a lot of them, and uh, I basically realized it's very cool people who are very insightful. So I felt, uh, I felt really happy and like I think I'm very cool and very insightful and hence I'm very intelligent. So then I stopped giving it thought for 45 days, right? Um, and then Rita Ma'am made me about 14 days ago and she's like, I hope you have your presentation. I'm like, yeah, I have my presentation. I've got some insights done. But, uh, and then I stopped giving it thought again. Um, and then on the Friday that it was due, um, I was like, oh shit. What have I really done to go beyond? Um, but then I realized it's still the weekend due, so I don't think she'll look at my presentation till it's Monday morning, so I have two more days. So I'll, I'll think about it on Sunday. I watched another video, which was probably the most insightful TED talk I watched, which was on the scale of procrastination. Right? So on Sunday night at 8 o'clock, I watched this video on the scale of procrastination, and I thought, wow, I think that is my key skill. But then I also read all the key comments and there and you can't like copy and plagiarize and all of that. So you should watch that video, it's really funny. But uh, I was like, okay, so my key skill has been taken away, so I can't really procrastinate about this any longer. So let me actually start thinking. Um, and you know what, I actually came to the realization that um, I've been called here because I left something which is perceived to be very safe very, very dependable, very cushy, but to me, in the 60 days of thinking about it, it never came as a big risk, right? It never seemed to be something that really, like, was out of the ordinary, right? So, I started thinking along those lines a little bit more, and I was like, probably that is what I'm going to talk about, because uh, if there is a big, big, difference between where you currently are at and where you're looking to go, that mountain almost seems insurmountable, right? Just as Rhea spoke about like acclimatizing yourself to that environment and to that rare air, the same way you need to go through the process, right? And it takes time and actually you go beyond every day. You go beyond a little bit, a little bit and then a little bit. And then suddenly to everyone outside you, you suddenly got beyond and you become this whole different person. But it actually takes a long time and it's very, very small incremental gains which you basically go through every day, which kind of make it such that you go beyond and you truly become someone or you truly do something that you couldn't have even fathomed doing before. So, I just really wanted to talk about the process right, and kind of bring you all to that place where you can actually think about how does one go beyond or am I on the right track to go beyond a few years from now, right. So I think the first thing that was very important to me and uh, that came out like immediately on think, giving this some thought on Sunday night was uh, building the right habits but also building the right habits early. Right? I think someone referenced it uh, about 30 minutes ago that it's very difficult to train an adult brain but it's incredibly easy to train a child's brain, right? And it's an incredibly flexible, almost scale-like piece of human body that you can mold into whatever, right? So I think building the right habits and having built the right habits early really help you go a long way um, kind of later in life. So. I'll just talk about the right habits, right? I think I could stand here and say build the right habits and then don't smoke, don't drink, don't drink and drive and all of these kind of things. But I think broadly two or three things have stood out for me. One's kind of having a regular schedule, right? The second one's been constantly competing, competing broadly and also competing to win. Um, I know at Shiram we speak a lot about participation. I'll come to that as well. I think uh, that's the first part of how you start competing. But eventually you have to compete to win. Right? Um, and I think the third thing for me is 
being comfortable to express your opinions, right? Um, I think you, it's a key, key skill that elevates you above everyone else who is similar to you and has the same IQ, has the same EQ, but if you're the one expressing the thought, there's only one time a thought is said for the first time, right, in any particular room. So it's very important that you're that person. So I think I'll just, I'll just go into a few details around all of this. Uh, so at the time I was still stuck at 18 and 14, so I guess I have a lot of time. So I have a lot of points. So, so regular schedule, right? Let me just give you a taste for what I mean by that. So uh, when I was kind of 10 or 11, that's when we started uh, coming into the school teams, the junior school teams. I would pretty much wake up at 5.15, we would be in school by 6.00. We would play football till 8.30, right? You're incredibly tired after that, but you have a five minute break. You then go to school for eight hours of class, right? And then I would come back home, 40 minute break, I would go for tennis for four hours. I would basically come back home at 8.30, completely spend, eat food, go to sleep. This is the same thing that happened Monday to Friday, right? Uh, up till pretty much class 11 or 12. And actually Saturday I would also wake up at 5.30 because we had this extra fitness class in tennis. After all of that running, I don't know why we needed extra fitness class, but... And I would wake up at 5.30 and we would be at tennis again at 4.30. And I would come back, I would eat and pretty much sleep. And the same thing on Sunday, I would wake up at 6 because we had extra fitness class again. But if you think about that, that's exactly how my day was when I was in college as well. Right? I would wake up to the football team, I would go to class, I would then go for extra cat classes to prepare for this exam that was this big thing. And I would come back home at like 9, 9.30 and go to sleep. That was, that is the same exact day that I had when I was even working at ECT. Except like class and fitness class and tennis and basketball got replaced by work. But I would still wake up at 5.30. I would, as an associate, prepare stuff for my partner before he woke up and before he could get to breakfast. And then I would work right through and I would come back home at 9, 9.30, you're so tired, right, you would go back to sleep. As a project leader, I had the luxury of waking up at 6.30 because I knew my associate woke up at 5.30 to kind of prepare stuff for me. But that's exactly the same day. And that was, and when people question whether like, how are you doing this on a Saturday or how are you doing this on a Sunday? It actually never struck me until I started writing this down that I've actually been doing the same thing on a Saturday and a Sunday as I've been doing on a Monday and a Friday for almost my entire life since I was 10. So to suddenly at 25 or 26 say that, oh no, because BCG has a five day work week and because it's like nine to eight and our clients are off on Saturday and Sunday. For me to suddenly go like, okay, I'm not going to work on Saturday, Sunday. That seems weirder than actually going and working on Saturday and Sunday. Right? So, that doesn't mean to say that all of you should work on Saturday, Sunday, or you should wake up for fitness class and all of those. Yeah. But the point being that you need to build these habits early. Right? And the habits you build early are actually very difficult to break out of. So make sure you build the right habits, right? Um, and I think the other point that I wanted to make in this is also that you will, as you keep growing up in life, right? You will be surrounded by a group of people who will be very similar in pretty much all aspects in terms of ability, in terms of emotional quotient, in terms of what they have achieved in life, right? When we were at Sheenam, we were all starting from zero. Right, then you go to SRCC and it becomes a more homogeneous pool. And then you go to IIM and it becomes a more homogeneous pool of people, at least in terms of IQ. And then you go to BCG and it's like an even more homogeneous pool. Right, so to stand out, you cannot always rely on the fact that I can work smarter. Right, at some level you have to work longer and you have to work harder. Right, so I just, I wanted to leave you guys with that thought that if you, if you read any, and I love reading autobiographies, so if you read any autobiography about any very successful person who goes beyond the ball and wake up at 4.30, right? Warren Buffet, uh, Elon Musk, right? Uh, 
Sun, uh, Adela, everyone wakes up at 4.30 or 5. And they wake up at 4.30 or 5 on Sunday as well, get their stuff done before their family wakes up. There's a reason for that. That's because they are at the top, top of the pyramid. Everyone is equally skilled or more intelligent. Right? So you need to work more. So that was one part. I think it seems from my procrastination suddenly started working too much. But uh, another another thing that I found very useful is to constantly compete, compete broadly and compete to win. The reason I put all of these three things together, I think um, as children it's very important to compete broadly. By complete broadly, I basically mean participate in everything you can. Right? As a child, you have an or as a student in a school, you have the advantage that you can do a dance competition, an inter-house dance competition, you can do an inter-house debate competition, you can do an inter-school sports competition, and you also have academic tests in class. You have the opportunity to compete in such a broad array of uh, events or of walks of life that that opportunity only narrows. Right? And the skill set you make or the skill set you develop as a student is basically a, like a universal set of skill sets that you develop as an adult. You'd only find you a few more of them, you pick up very new, new skills. Right? So compete broadly, which basically means participate in everything. Which is I think why at school we always said participate and participating is important. Compete constantly. Right? It is a habit and that's kind of uh, what I was coming to initially as well, that you build the right habits and build them early. Competing and putting yourself out there is a habit, right? And you only get used to it after you do it multiple times, right? Um, it's not the best example, but I stood on this stage pretty much for 360 days twice in my life in class 11 and 12 when I was sports vice captain and I was head boy of school and I've pretty much done this about 700 times that's why I could think about writing this on Sunday evening or I could not worry about the fact that I'm going to stand in front of 100 people and talk but it just happened right if I was worried about this I would have done my speech a lot earlier but similarly I know that when I walk into a room with a CEO now because I have presented to at least 100 CEOs Everyone from someone who runs a 100 crore company to someone who runs a 6 billion dollar revenue company. I feel very comfortable, right? I just need to think about the content. I don't really need to think about how I'm going to present myself. Right? So compete constantly. Whatever you want to get good at, you need to immerse yourself in that. You can't learn from a distance, right? But you can only learn so much from a distance unless you're in it. Right? And compete to win. I think uh, this goes without uh, being said. But I have a funny anecdote about this. And uh, this is something my mother told me before this happened and I never uh, took keep. So we were preparing for our class 6 exam. At that time, the Chinam exams only happened from class 6 onwards. Yeah, okay. So and we never even had like uh, mark tests. We always had good, very good. So it was very subjective and like happy go lucky. And it was quite fun. So the exams came around, I'm like, okay, this is this seems like fun, we'll go, we'll read the text, anyway, it's uh, like a test. And then suddenly, like, you come back from the exam and you're like, shit, these are actually like graded answers and you need to write pages upon pages. And the first award ceremony happened for academic results. And I got recently, I think I got 89% or 89.4, I remember it very clearly because it was in 90. Right, but I've not won any award, and uh, I was sat in the audience, and I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, like I thought this was all like fun and games and happy go lucky, and I took the exam. They also took the exam. Why are they kind of getting commemorated for doing slightly better? But then I realized that yes, you compete broadly, you constantly compete, but you have to compete to win, right? Uh, you will not win at everything, but what you want to be really, really good at, you need to win. And you need to make that a habit because till you don't actually compete to win, you will always feel you're better than you actually are. 
right? Or you always like another anecdote comes up. We would play cricket in the colony park all the time, right? And there were some of my friends who would play, and like we would as if, as one team, we were just so much better because all of us were in the school team. We would beat the other team every day, right? But we would beat them every day. There was there was no okay let them win someday or let them know we would win every day even though we weren't competing for any like monetary prize or anything but it just happened to the point that even when we still meet I don't think they, they think they can be better than us in cricket though none of us would have played cricket for 15 years right but that's the point you basically have to do it again and again and again till you believe that that's the only way it will happen right so. That's the second one. So I have a regular schedule, don't work on Sundays. Constantly compete, compete broadly, compete to win. And then just be very comfortable with expressing your opinion. Right? And I think this is almost one of the most important like things I want you guys to take away from this. Um, and this is something that we learn very well at Sheena. It is it is almost an unfair advantage compared to everyone else from any other school. Like, uh, I have been in classrooms with everyone from uh, IIT to, uh, to uh, Howard to Duke to uh, Cambridge, right? Um, you basically, till you don't express your thoughts, no one knows what you're thinking. Or no one knows what's going on or how intelligent you are or have you really cracked this problem, right? Um, and this is something that at Shiran you get this safe environment where in class two you're encouraged to elevate a poem, right? Uh, all the way up to class six you're reading paragraphs from textbooks, right? Um, we used to even narrate in bed, I remember in class nine and ten in class, right? Uh, everyone has to participate in dance and drama. Right? You're basic, basically, what you're learning is to be comfortable with expressing your thoughts and expressing your thoughts in not a natural situation. Right? You're expressing your thoughts in a place where most people are very uncomfortable. You're standing in front of 100 people and doing dance. Like I remember I had to participate in some inter-house dance competition but that was because everyone had to participate in one extracurricular activity and I was like, Okay, dance is the only one I guess <laughs> I got selected for. But that is what it is, right? Um, and till you and that's basically forcing you to express yourself, right? And the next stage of that is actually expressing your thoughts. Once you get comfortable with being in this surrounding and expressing yourself, you'll be a lot more comfortable with expressing what you're thinking. Right. Um, and I think just a couple of anecdotes to go with that because it, that that's probably what will stick with you more than all of this uh, all of this uh, jazz that I'm speaking about. But in in college, uh, I was I was termed butt man or butt sir because uh, every time I was in class, right? Um, and I went to class vocation. Uh, um, I would always be curious about something the professor was presenting and I would always raise my hand and be like, but sir, or but ma'am, and uh, everyone in class would go, no, like, you know, I can't, like, can't you just like, let the bell ring? But genuinely, like, for me, it was just, like, I would not even think about all that that they said around me the next time I had to raise my hand. Because over 16 years of being at Sheena, I was so inculcated that okay, if I have a thought, I'm gonna ask my question, you guys can think whatever you think. Right? Uh, similarly, the first steering committee I did at BCG, your steering committee is where you basically get in front of a CEO, you present all of these fancy models and thoughts you come up with as an overweight consulting firm. So uh, so I was I was the junior most and a piece of analysis that I had done came up. And uh, typically the project leader presents the whole deck and he started presenting my slide and I, I remember so distinctly I got up and I was like, Kapish, I can present my slide and he's like, he literally looked at me like I'd be stupid, like the word, the word other than that we're supposed to speak. But promptly I went on and I'm like, so the analysis and the objective and he's like, okay, I guess I have no choice but you're going to present your slide. 
But what I did is there was BCG's India head in that room. There was a CEO of uh, BCG's first ever healthcare client, which was at the time a 4,000 crore company, right? And there was my partner on my project, like basically the head of the project. And to this day, like all three of them distinctly remember that moment. And all three of them distinctly remember that when I, at that point, we decided that we're going to keep you on for the entire project. Because, you know what, it's invaluable to have an associate who's comfortable presenting their own work. Because my project leader there doesn't need to go for that meeting, so my project leader can help someone else out to do something else. It was an unsaid norm at BCG that an associate doesn't present, but no one had figured out why the associates not present because associates aren't confident enough to present. It's not as if people don't want associates to present, right? So just expressing your thoughts and being comfortable with even being in an uncomfortable public situation, right, is a big thing. I think more than anything else, this will elevate you. If you're, if you're wrong, it will elevate you because it will force you to be better and be better thought out and be better prepared the next time. If you're right, it will elevate you because you would have said the right thing when no one else was willing to say something and you'd be the first in the room to have expressed that thought. So, I come prepared with a longer speech, but I see I'm two and a half minutes over. So, I just want to leave you guys with, with one last thing. I think building the right habits, so have a regular schedule and push yourself. Compete, compete to win, right? Um, Express your thoughts. More than anything else, don't be afraid to express your thought. And I think uh, I was talking to Vikram Ma'am before this. She's like, you called me there because you've taken a risk. Um, because of these three habits, the risk did seem that big to me. Right? And the, so I would never encourage anyone to take a risk, but take a measured risk. I think just uh, what, what do I mean by a measured risk? So I was about 26 and a half when I left PCG, or 27, but I already worked there for five years, right? Everyone in my peer group was 31. That's because they went to IIT for four years there, then they worked for two years, and then they joined PCG, and I was lucky enough to be promoted six months faster than the average. So I had about four years on all of them, because I went to, uh, I did an econ, I never worked before business school, I kind of got promoted a little faster. So I was 27 where everyone in my peer group was 31 or 30. I basically had three or four free years to be at medium. And medium of probably the top one percentile of the student base in India. Right? So I built myself a buffer. And I essentially then realized that if I don't take this risk, I'm taking a bigger risk of thinking back at 45 that hey, uh, I'm 45 and my peer group is 48. Like that doesn't sound as cool as I'm 26 or 27 and my peer group is 50 and I'm taking this risk. Right? So build yourself that buffer by running a little bit faster, by being a little bit better earlier. Right? So that you can, when you build that buffer, you can actually take the risk that will propel you into the next office. Right? So that's about it. Thank you so much for the time.